Saint Innocent and for Palamas. But I think it was a useful one to hear, especially the part about pruning. Um, we had to deal with our trees in our backyard that were totally out of control. We weren't producing flowers properly or anything. And we were required by checking out pruning processes that you had to cut things way, way, way back. Our lilac bush, we cut down pretty much to nothing. And it came back so, so incredibly the next year. My dear brothers and sisters, this is part of what Lent is all about. It's about pruning. There's all kinds of stuff in our lives that if it is not pruned, it makes it so that eventually we're like a wild grapevine and not a pruned grapevine, a wild vine or a wild, uh, our neighbor across the back fence from us has an apple tree they haven't pruned in a long time and it's not producing any fruit anymore. And my brothers and sisters, two ways the pruning happens. We do it voluntarily or the Lord does it for us. And if he doesn't do it for us and we don't do it for ourselves either, we have problems. But that's not the gospel. <laughs> and that's not what I really wanted to preach on. But really think about it. Fruit only comes if we have been dealing with the dead branches, with the branches that have gone wild and crazy on us. And actually, this brings me to several prelude um, statements I want to make. A couple of days ago, I was home alone, which doesn't happen very often. And I was sitting in the living room, taking a break from all the work that I was doing. And I was looking at Instagram, partly because I have a couple of kids that are active on it. And because St. Elizabeth Convent uh, has an excellent uh, Instagram thing, a few things like that. But I came across a little video it's being taken from right by the curb of a, of a sidewalk facing towards a number of small shops in a commercial area, maybe downtown or in one of these sort of, you know, classy, old style, hippie type of places. And people are walking by, not very regularly, you know, one, you know, a person, a couple, maybe two or three together. And whoever is filming it, is asking everybody that goes by, do you believe in Jesus? Well, by the time the first 10 people have gone by, some single and some as couples, all saying no, I was starting to wait for somebody to say yes. But it continued on that way, 15, 20. Some of the people were not saying anything to him. They would look at him or not look at him and walk by. But most of them said something, and not one person said yes. Now I'm hoping that the ones that were looking at annoyed at him actually believed in Jesus and were not interested in being outed because they're afraid to acknowledge that they're believers. But you kind of didn't get the impression that they were like that. And I was thinking, oh my God, by the time 50 had gone by, and every single one, in a typical, I think it was probably an American town or city, had said no. I was thinking, yep, it's a good sign of where things are going. And I was quite saddened by it. Today we're celebrating the Sunday of St. Gregory Palamas, and we also celebrate St. Innocent of Alaska at the same time. And again, I'm not planning to spend much more time on on it than a few words. I mean, because of Gregory Palamas, uh, we're allowed to say the Jesus prayer. We're allowed to pray silently, the Hesychist prayers, um, instead of having to pray out loud and, and to say anathema, heresy, to the Jesus prayer, which uh, was standard in the Western church for many centuries. Um, it all started because a fellow named Barlaam, who pretended to be Orthodox, but when he was losing the fight with 
the Lamas goes to the Catholic Church where he is received with open arms. It all started because our Lama was insisting that not only can you not know the essence of God, you also cannot, un cannot know his energies and be affected by his, by, and know them. I'll just leave it like that for now. Uh, and this all started because he insisted that the, uh, the transfiguration on the Mount of, on the, on the Mount Tabor, the light that was seen by the disciples was a created light. It was not his energies. Palamas <laughs> wins the argument, at least in the East, that yes, that was an uncreated light and that you can actually experience in your lives the uncreated energies of God. It's part of what's necessary, in fact, if theosis is possible. If we can become like God, it means the energies of God need to be able to abide in and dwell in us. And of course, Innocent was, uh, we call him the apostle uh, to America and the enlightener of the Aleuts. And one of the things he did upon his arrival was to translate a number of the scriptures and, and services into the languages of the people that were present there. He spent his first year or two not doing any ministry at all, but sitting down with a uh, member of one of the uh, tribes up there who trained him and taught him and helped him with the translations and things. And as I was saying last night, it's one of the reasons we're allowed to be in this church and the services are in English because we have examples of people that have been willing to say the services need to be in the language that the people understand because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and you've got to understand it. And I harp on that sometimes. I know you hear it too often from me. Forgive me. But be very thankful for that. Be very thankful that you can understand um, St. John Chrysostom, someone we love to reference as being, and we refer, refer to his works like we, we always are quoting the fathers on the scriptures and etc. etc. And Father St. John Chrysostom was insistent, listen, okay, it's fine to be hearing what I'm saying about them but you should be reading the scriptures directly yourself. Among other things, you can't fully guarantee that anything that the fathers have said, that everything is accurate. They do make some mistakes too, but you need to be reading the scriptures. And during Lent, Monday through Friday, we're listening to Old Testament. And on Saturday and Sunday only right now, we're hearing from the Gospels from the New Testament. And the Gospel from yesterday, I want to read it to you because the Gospel for today follows immediately after this one. And I want you to hear it. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. He was hiding. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. But he said to them, let's go to the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was teaching, preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down before and saying to him, if, and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go on your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. The word is martyrian, martyr testimony, a testimony to the priests. This worked. I'm healed. 
goes back to the Old Testament. If a person came to the point where it appeared that he was healed of, of leprosy, before he could re-enter society, he had to go to the priests. They had to do a bunch of uh, ceremony, etc., and then they affirmed, confirmed, they witnessed that he was healed, that he was cleansed. But he's being told, go be a testimony, go be a witness to them. He also told, also was told not to say anything, but of course, he blows that. He goes around and starts telling everybody what's happened so that he was so in demand that he couldn't go into the towns. And then, of course, immediately after begins the new reading for today. He finally says, okay, I'm coming back. I'm going back to Capernaum. And he shows up there. And it was heard in, that he was in the house. Hey, he's back. <laughs> and immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And this uh, translation of the gospel says, and he preached the word to them, but uh, the actual Greek says, and he was speaking the word to them. And in fact, let's face it, it was the word speaking the word to them. And they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four. The English translations always say four men, but the uh, Greek doesn't have men in it. They throw that in because it's, for, first of all, in the masculine form, and they always may want to make sure you know it was men that were doing this. But there's an emphasis on the fact that it was four bringing. And there's a whole lot of stuff that you can look at around what that four means besides just the four men. And so we hear about them breaking down, taking the roof off of the house so they can get him in. Wouldn't you just love someone to come along and take the roof off of your house? To lower somebody? You had to have real guts and real faith to take a risk like that. And a real hope, a real desire, a real wish that something special is going to happen. And then it says, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Lying flat, paralyzed. Your sins are forgiven you. Seems like an odd thing to do, first off. We don't hear that the paralytic had actually even asked, forgive my sins. Did he even say anything? We don't know. But Jesus, without even being asked to forgive the sins, said, your sins are forgiven you. By the way, by the authority invested in me as a priest, I'm saying to all of you, your sins are forgiven. Not that you're having asked, but you maybe need to come and talk about it to just get a confirmation because you have troubles believing that to be the case. But your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. The actual word is dialog di dialoguing. They were having a conversation with themselves. My wife will sometimes say to me, who are you talking to? What do you mean, who are you talking to? Well, you're going like this. Who are you talking to? You ever done that? Have you ever been caught talking to yourself or talking to or about somebody in your head? Your friends sometimes could, if they wanted to, they could say, you're talking to somebody. Who are you talking to? What's going on in that head of yours? Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now that comes out of the Old Testament, you know. It does say God alone is able to forgive sins. But as you know from the Lord's Prayer, when his disciples ask him, teach us to pray like John, your cousin, has taught his disciples to pray, Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, da 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 da, and forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So we have been authorized. We've been given authority from the one who has the authority from his heavenly Father to forgive sins. So we have the authority, and not only the authority, the responsibility to forgive sins. So immediately, when he perceived in there that they reasoned thus within themselves, dialogue within themselves, he said to them, why do you have these conversations in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. Now, I know that for some people, saying your sins are forgiven is about the hardest thing that you would ever have to try to do because they have hardened their hearts so hard that the concept of forgiving is beyond their capability. And may that never be the case with us. And maybe they're pretty <coughs> tough. Maybe they've gotten a pretty tough skin over those hearts. But those tough skins have to soften. And we have to be able to learn to forgive. Because as Jesus says, for if you forgive your sins, your Father will forgive you your sins. But if you do not forgive your neighbor, your brother, his sins, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. It's a pretty heavy duty way of looking at it. I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to, to your house. There, see? I've got the authority to do that, forgiving sins. I raised him up. The other works for me too. Would that our faith in all of us was at such a level that as Peter and the other disciples were able to do, were able to say, arise, get up and walk. And we should strive very hard for that to even be the case for us. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified, God saying, we never saw anything like this. We never witnessed, we never had seen anything like that. And we can now bear testimony to it. We have this huge attraction to saints. Why are we attracted to saints? And why does one saint or a number of saints become the ones that we are attracted to? Well, it better not just be because there are heroes. But it better be because in some way they bear testimony to how God's salvation has worked for them in such a way that, hey, that that's the kind of thing I need to do too. Hey, you're helping me. You're bearing witness to me of this great salvation that is present for us. These two are witnesses to what is the truth and to the way that things work and function properly and bring us into the presence of God. Mary, in all our icons, or most of our icons of her, are bearing witness to salvation. And my brothers and sisters, let our lives form in such a way. Let it be for us that we are able to see, say, I have seen the Lord. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Faith is the seeing of the unseen energies, the unseen reality of God's salvation and grace. And may it be that we, like all these saints, be able to witness to those people walking down the street who say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. And may it be that they come to believe in Jesus, that they come to recognize him as their Lord and their God and their Savior and the one drawing us into his kingdom, which is not just his kingdom, but the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst.